looking here. If uh, John McCain had stood up against Tarp uh, last fall, do you think he'd be president today? I think he might have been. Um, I do believe that the turning point in the presidential election last fall was John McCain suspending his campaign, going to Washington, and in essence sort of melting into the body of the Senate and I, I've gotten in some trouble for saying this, but I said sort of meekly raising his hand and saying, me too. He looked like a senator, not like a president when he did that. America was looking for a president. Barack Obama looked like a president that weekend. John McCain looked like a senator. I think the election was fundamentally over at that moment. I've said that publicly. I continue to campaign for Senator McCain vigorously, energetically, to the point that I lost my voice in Joplin, Missouri, on the day before the election from nonstop seven events a day. So it wasn't that I gave up personally, and I still believe that he would have been the better of the two candidates. Uh, and I have great respect for him. Never said anything unkind about him, even when I, he was my opponent. But now that the, the game is over, uh, I, I feel the freedom to, uh, to be very frank and say I think that that was when the election essentially was over. Now, would Republican appointees like Paulson and Bernanke pushing for TARP, right. a lot of people supporting it. Does the Republican Party have any credibility now on bailouts and all that? And if not, how does the Republican Party regain credibility? Well, they didn't have any last fall uh, since it was our administration and our appointees and, and even Republicans in Congress going along with it. I think some Republicans, thank God, have begun to, f have begun to find their voice. And I'm so very grateful to the people like Mike Pence, who's one of my personal congressional heroes. I think he is a principled individual, and he understands what he went to Congress to do. And it wasn't just to see if he could be man of the year uh, in the Congressional uh, Love Club. And I appreciate that very much. Um, Republicans can certainly recover from this, but I think Republicans have got to be honest. You know, you can't be saved unless you repent. And uh, Republicans need to repent. There's some real uh, sins of commission that were committed, and I think that it's going to be hard to regain the credibility if we don't uh, stand up and tell it like it was. Uh, let's do a little lightning round. Uh, short questions, short answers. Uh, do I get to do, provide the thunder if you do the lightning? <laughs> exactly. Very good. Very good. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, the rather punitive bill in relation to AIG, it seems, and bonuses. Are you for that, against that? Oh, I'm against it. It's absurd. And, and here's the problem. Uh, if we're going to cut tax somebody 90 percent, we ought to tax the members of Congress 90 percent. They're as much responsible for this as AIG. Tax their side. You know, I'm not defending AIG. I've been as vocal, probably more so than most people, about my utter outrage at the manner in which all of this has been handled. Uh, so I'm not letting them off the hook or excusing what they did. But there's two problems. First of all, I think that there's a constitutional issue of going back and retroactively trying to impose a law uh, after they have operated within the context of a law. Um, I can tell you later, I know it's a lightning round, so I guess I'll tell you later about a situation in Arkansas that we had to deal with involving uh, a school shooting where you can't go back and reach behind you and apply a law that did not exist at the time of a crime. Okay, let's have some thunder. Tell us about that. Okay. <laughs> I knew you would ask. I just knew it. Uh, 1998, last day of March. Many of you uh, may remember. Some of you probably were too young from here to maybe recall this. But uh, West, Side, uh, West Side Middle School, Jonesboro, Arkansas, two boys, 111, 113, took high-powered rifles, skipped school, set up an ambush point, let off a fire alarm. Kids and teachers all went out in the playground where it was a fenced-in area. And they unloaded on them with five high-powered rifles, killed four of their fellow students, uh, killed one teacher, wounded 12 others. It was an absolutely horrific crime. I mean, literally just shot these people in cold blood. Um, it, it, I, I can't begin to tell you how awful it was. Um, the outrage that people had was only enhanced when it became public knowledge that because of the juvenile laws in Arkansas, we could only hold these kids until their 18th birthdays. And people were just beyond outraged. And you can imagine the victims' families were most of all outraged. And there was loud protest. And the truth was, we could not say, this is horrible. These kids ought to be in prison for a long, long time. The law said that you can only be in prison until you're 18. 
are actually in juvenile custody. We, we couldn't even try them as adults. Now, the point was that up until that moment, it had never occurred to anyone in the 130-year history of our state that an 11 and a 13-year-old would take high-powered rifles and assassinate their fellow students and a teacher on a school campus. We just had not thought of that as being a possibility. We immediately went into special session and we corrected our law. We did what a lot of other states uh, have done since, and that's created what's called blended sentencing, which they are adjudicated as juveniles and then they later will be transferred into an adult system. But you cannot retroactively apply. Believe me, we wanted to find a way, uh, not just because we wanted vengeance on those two young men, but we wanted to protect people from them and protect them from a whole state full of people who would have uh, taken them apart if they could have done so. Okay. A couple of other questions on economics. Uh, club for Growth, still think of it as the Club of Greed? Uh, I have not had a good relationship with him. I was talking to uh, Brett Chandler a few minutes ago and I, he was asking had I tried to patch things up mm -hmm. and I said, yeah, I actually asked to go meet with him at my initiation because I thought, you know, that maybe we can clear the air. And I went to Washington, I sat down uh, with them, and the net result was I, I came away thinking that they pretty well had their minds made up. Their donors influenced their direction, and I was very disappointed. But, you know, I can't help it. Okay. I know that my record is one that is far more conservative than some of the people that they supported, and that's been borne out by, st you know, very clear objective studies. And it became obvious to me that it was about who paid them money, not where candidates stood, and, and that was unfortunate. Okay. Thinking of disappointments, how much money have you personally lost in September in stock market? Uh, the good thing for me is I didn't have a whole lot. Okay. Every now and then there's an advantage of not having a whole lot of resources. Right. You know, I'm, I'm starting now for the first time in my life to, to make more money than I ever made in public service and certainly more than I made in in the pastorate, but interestingly, I made more money as a pastor than I did as a governor. Uh, really took a pay cut to, uh, to do it. Uh, so, you know, I also look at it this way. I have a place to sleep, I've got food, and my life is not what I possess. And in fact, my wife and I this year, because, you know, the economic situation is what it is, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to say this for any reason other than just to say our, our personal philosophy, my wife and my, and, and my philosophy is that in times like this, it's better to give more away. Mm -hmm. And so we have uh, increased, we've always tithed. We have now uh, decided we will give a minimum of 15% to our church and then other things. Because uh, what you try to keep, you can't hold on to. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you really can see having value is what you give away. And uh, there's, a, there's a great story. J.C. Penney, the founder of the J.C. Penney Company. I worked for them when I was 14. Uh, one of two jobs I had when I was 14. The other was a radio station. And interestingly, J.C. Penney had built this retail enterprise. It had done very well. He was a millionaire, and he was a great benefactor. He was also a, a, a believing uh, Christian, and he was a great benefactor to churches, hospitals, uh, universities, and many charitable institutions libraries, etc. When the Depression hit, he lost everything, and he had to start all over. And he, of course, rebuilt the business, and it became, you know, one of the great empires of uh, retailing. He was being interviewed by a business reporter later in life, and he was asked the question, Mr. Penny, you lost everything you had, yet you had given millions of dollars away. Do you regret what you gave away? I mean, after all, all that money you gave away you sure could have used when the bottom fell out. He said, oh no, you don't understand. He said, everything I gave, I kept because all the things that I gave still educated students and healed sick people in hospitals, provided books for people who couldn't afford them. And he went through the whole litany. He said, all that stuff remained. Everything I gave away, I kept. The only things I lost were the things I tried to keep. He said, I learned an important lesson. I thought, wow, what a powerful testimony of possessions. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and no one ever saw a... Uh uh, Hearst pulling a U-Haul. That's right. So, um, let's see. Let me turn to some questions on um, politics. Uh, where do you think the religious right went wrong? They became more enamored with the process of politics than the principles of uh, conviction. And when when I saw pretty firsthand a lot of people saying. 
for, we don't think you can win. We like what you stand for. You stand for everything we stand for. Uh, you are one of us. As I've told many people within the evangelical world in particular, I don't come to you, I come from you. That was not in any way an understanding on my part that there should have been an automatic endorsement or support. But if there was not, there should have been some understanding of why. And the reason for which I was given repeatedly was, we don't think you can win. And we're going to support someone who can win. And it was all about who can win and having a, quote, proverbial seat at the table. And that became the obsession, a seat at the table. I'm thinking at what table? If the food's not fit to eat, why would you want a seat at the table? But my, my assessment throughout the process, and, and especially looking you know, at it now from the distance, is that there were people who supported candidates who did not share their convictions about the sanctity of human life, about the uh, sacredness of marriage, and about even uh, economic issues as it relates to preserving the empowerment of individual families as opposed to government making decisions that really encroach upon those families by economic means. But the decision was made for support based on who do we think is likely to win. And I just found that that was very frustrating because uh, then, here, here's the, the, the net result of that. If decisions are made to support a candidate, and I'm not just talking about religious people, this is true for anyone, on the basis of who's going to win rather than who represents your point of view that you're involved uh, primarily to support, then you really are no longer a significant uh, player in the political process. Let me say it this way. I'll try to. If the NRA says, you know, guns are important, but what we really care about is uh, we care about global warming, and we want to make sure that candidates are also right on global warming, and we also care about uh, uh, tax on food, and, and you know, go through a whole then the NRA becomes ineffective. The reason they're effective is because when you deal with the NRA, you know there's one thing they care about, the Second Amendment. You're with them, they're with you. Doesn't matter, you're Democrat, Republican, they don't care. They got an issue. And you're either going to be with them or against them, and they're going to be with you or against you. And I, I appreciate that. The right to work people, same way. And there are organizations on the left, you know, Greenpeace. Uh, you're going to have organizations, and they got an issue. You're with them, they're with you, you're not with them. <laughs> Your drums will grow at some point in your life. <laughs> but my assessment was that when Christians say they're going to get involved as Christians, and then they abandon the issues for which they are essentially motivated, then they become just another, they might as well be the Republican women of uh, Ponset County somewhere. They, they, they become irrelevant as issue players. So in, in, this, in this book, the voice of God here, in this, in, this, uh, in this book, you, uh, you chastise the Arlington group in particular as a group of conservative Christians uh, who did not get behind you. Now, a couple of questions here. Uh, first of all, had they gotten behind you, do you think you actually could have gotten the nomination? In other words, uh, people looking back say, well, he couldn't do it because he was a Christian conservative candidate. You can't get a majority of the Republican Party. Do you think if things had, if they had gotten behind you, that would have been different? The honest answer is I don't know. Could have done more harm than good. It could have been that the perception was that I was the uh, sort of the wholly owned subsidiary of the Christian conservative movement. Okay. What, what I think was frustrating to me, there was a certain uh, issue with the secular press that they attempted to marginalize me as, quote, a religious candidate, part of which was because 20 years ago, I was a pastor. Now, you never heard them talk about, what was Mitt Romney 20 years ago? What did Giuliani do 20 years ago? What they failed to re realize was that I had more executive experience having actually run a government than anybody on that stage. Mm -hmm. And I had reformed education in my state. We had rebuilt a road system. I had dealt with everything from the health care system, for which Time Magazine uh, had given me accolades as one of the five best governors of the year. I mean, I could go through all this. The sure. point was, I wasn't running for president because I went to church Sunday and I had a certain spiritual point of view. My spiritual point of view was something I was not ashamed of, and I never ran from those questions because I felt that it was part of 
being a believer, to be honest and bold and never backing off and acting like that I'm ashamed of it. In fact, to even go so far as to say that it was not a compartment of my life that I could take off like a sweater and leave the church on Sunday and then become anything I wanted to be the rest of the week. That appalls me. I can't imagine that a person would say that that's consistent with faith. But what was very troubling was that this uh, attitude prevailed that, well, Mike Huckabee, let's ask him the religious questions. We went through 11 debates as Republican candidates, and there was not one question ever asked to any of us about education. And I'd been the chairman of the Education Commission of the States, a 50-state compact for, for uh, two years, and been the chairman of the Southern Regional Education Board. I mean, there were so many ways in which that could have been a very valid issue, but never brought up. Yeah, agreed on that. It, it seems clear, to use a theological term non-theologically, that you're damned if you do and damned if you don't in the situation. Thank you for couching the theological term. Exactly. Nobody <laughs> That's exactly right. But going forward, going forward, because I'm sure it hasn't escaped you that let's say four of the last five Republican nominees have been people who ran before and lost and then came back and ran again. I had not heard that. You've uh, you heard it here the first time. Uh, <laughs> what do you do now? Uh, in other words, uh, with folks of the Arlington Group and yeah. others, uh, can you gar gather them behind you at this point, uh, having had this unexpected success, at least unexpected to them? Uh, where, how, how do you go at yeah, this point? I haven't expected them any yeah. Well, you know, but the, the end of the campaign, Two things happened. First of all, the Arlington group as a group pretty much dissipated. Right. I think that they splintered and split, and many of them uh, took issue with each other because they felt that they had failed to do what they originally compacted to do with each other, and that was they would early on interview people running, they would pick a candidate, they would all coalesce behind that one candidate, and they would try to unite the strength and force that they could. Well, they failed to do that, and they kept pushing back their own deadlines, and then they splintered about who they would support. So I think that as a group, I don't even know if they do exist anymore, but if they do, I, I think they're marginalized by their own actions. By the end of the campaign, I had many of the people who had been sort of standoffish who openly were supportive of me. And I think it was in many ways uh, helpful that the real strength of the campaign for me came not from a group of leaders sort of sequestered in a room as, uh, you know, the robed council. It really was just ordinary people out there, homeschool moms and dads and all sorts of folks, truck drivers, and that was the strength of the campaign, and I'm grateful that it was. And do you have a desire to run again? In other words, if you wake up and think, wow, that was, that was kind of fun, I want to do it again? <laughs> I think everybody assumes that I'm running, you know, that it's a, an absolute certainty. And, and I can tell you, absolutely look you in the eye, I don't know. Uh, I, I try to be honest with people, and the honest answer is, I don't know. Uh, I'm not being coy and saying, oh, no, I'm not going to run, because I might. I'm not saying that I would never consider it. But this very moment, it is not on my mind. It is not something I sit around thinking about. I am extraordinarily busy uh, doing my show on the Fox uh, News Channel every weekend. I'm having a great time with that. I'm doing three commentaries a day five days a week, Monday through Friday, for the ABC radio network. I'm speaking all over the place. I was in Orlando, uh, excuse me, Naples, Florida last night. I was in St. Louis the night before that. I was in uh, Palm Beach the night before that, and Jefferson City, Missouri the night before that. I'm not looking for something to do. Sound, <laughs> so, sounds like the itinerary of someone who's running. Uh, yeah, but what I'm running is, you know, trying to catch up from all these years of of uh, being a governor. I'm having a great time. I'm doing things I love to do. I'm raising money for uh, like the pro-life group in Missouri that I spoke for Monday night, an uh, organization called Big Life, which is a terrific yeah. missions organization yeah. out of Naples. Uh, I was there with Chuck Colson last night. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting to do some things. I'm also doing a lot of travel. Next week I'll be in Virginia campaigning uh, for McDonald, who's the uh, candidate there for uh, governor. I think it's going to be a great candidate for the Republicans, and so my PAC is busy helping candidates that are uh, involved in races. My attitude is that it may be that I never run again, and I'm okay with that. Uh, my running is not, to me, the, the only reason that I would be involved. It may be that my role in the future is to help other people through uh, the PAC and through other things that I can do that would give those candidates a voice and a platform, and if it is, I'm, I'm okay with that. But how do you avoid the typecasting? 
essentially, that, that you've already been subjected to. How do you break out of that box? That, that, uh, the Christian thing? The, Christ, the, Christian, the, the Christian thing. Yeah, yes. the Christian thing. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to break out of the box if the box means that people think that I'm somehow abandoning my faith. I, I, yeah. I'm not, in other words, if my faith is the reason that people say I'm not going to vote for him, then good, don't vote for me because I'm not going to quit being who I am in order to get your vote. And I can't. It, it, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And part of it is just because even if I got elected, the maximum I could serve is eight years. I, I'm looking at things or trying to from an eternal perspective. And that's why even being governor, when people ask me, is it hard being the governor, you know, because of this uh, Christian thing? You know? I told them, no, it's actually easier. I don't have to wake up every day and decide what I'm going to believe today. I don't have to change every day and say, what's the poll say? Oh, man, we've got to come up with a new, a new platform here. No, I, you know, and if I get defeated, I get defeated. That's, that's part of the deal. I, I'd rather be defeated and be able to go to my grave with some sense of consistency of conviction than I had to win every last office in America, including the presidency, but have to sell my soul to do it. I mean, I, I did grow up with that understanding that to gain the whole world and lose yeah. your own soul, what has it profited you? Well, the answer to that rhetorical question is nothing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Let me try another lightning round. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. uh, I blew the last one, didn't I? Who's, <laughs> who's your favorite Republican political leader? Ooh. Um, can you narrow the, the field or, I mean, congressional or just anybody? Let's, okay, let's, let's narrow it to congressional. Uh, Mike Pence. Okay. Yeah. Favorite Democrat. Fields so narrowed. Now you're now you're making me struggle. Uh, probably Phil Bredesen, Governor of Tennessee. I, I knew Phil well. Worked with him. He's he's much more of a practical guy. Uh, you know, not perfect in every way. We disagree on a lot of things. But what I saw Phil do was approach things from not how can I make my party look good, but what's right. And I, I appreciate that. Okay. Least favorite Republican. <laughs> Probably not going there here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, Anders, one thing, stupidity is, a, is just across that line. So. Uh, well, you just got out of that. Try, yeah, Marvin, yeah, really yeah. <laughs> okay, least favorite Democrat. Least favorite Democrat. Um, probably, huh. Maybe it would be, you know, I've got a bunch of them. That's a big one. <laughs> I don't mind saying, you know, their names. Um, I have a certain level of just utter contempt for people, and I'll put the category, uh, the Barney Franks of the world, because they were so responsible for a lot of the economic problems that we face and now are so indignant and self-righteous about how they're going to uh, see that these people get their just due. And, and it, to me, the, the hypocrisy of it is what is disturbing. Not their positions. I, you know, I can handle a person who is a liberal. I really can. I have respect for people who are philosophically liberal and believe what they believe and truly believe it with all their heart. I have no respect for people who will never accept responsibility for their own viewpoints or the logical conclusion to which they uh, go. Okay. Uh, is, uh, is the American Dream having your own TV show? Not, I mean, not, I mean, it's a wonderful experience and I'm having a great time doing it. I don't know that that's the American dream. I, I think for me the American dream is knowing that I came from a background that most people um, would perhaps think they're stuck in. You know, a background mm -hmm. where barely uh, had enough money to pay the rent where I lived as a kid and a little rent house on 2nd Street in Hope, Arkansas. Um, knowing I'm the first male in my entire family lineage mm -hmm. to graduate high school much less go to college. You know, for me, the American dream is what I've already been able to live through. Everything else is, is absolute you know, icing on this wonderful cake. Uh, married for 35 years, three adult children, all of whom have college degrees, and, um, you know, love God, love the country, uh, very active politically, and all Republicans, thank God. <laughs> um, you know, I, I look around, and I, I think, I'm living better than I ever dreamed I would. I've, I've been places, I've done things, I've met people that I never thought I would be within binocular vision of seeing in the smallest of frames. To have you know, spent the night in the Lincoln bedroom and to fly on Air Force One with the president, to actually see one in person. I, I never thought as a kid ever, ever that that would happen. And I'll tell this one thing, my dad took me to meet the governor of Arkansas when I was eight years old. I told this story a lot on the campaign trail because it really kind of summed it up. 
And I remember because governors didn't come to where we lived in the corner of the state. And he said, no, I'm going to take you down and see the governor. He's coming to make a speech and dedicate a lake. And I'm going to take you down there. You're going to hear the governor talk. Because, son, you may live your whole life, and you may never meet a governor in person. <laughs> and his, his world was, a governor is coming. You'll never be one. You, you might at eight get to meet one, and that's as close as you'll ever get, so you better take advantage of the opportunity. I mean, I just look at my life and say, you know, this is a great country. This is a great country. And it's great for anybody. It's not just me. It's anybody who, who is willing to work hard. Uh, don't, they don't have to look at where they come from and what their circumstances are. This is a country where people can get somewhere and do something significant. Yeah. It's a great country, and there are people who hate it. And I'm going to turn the questioning over to the floor in just a couple minutes, but let me just ask you on foreign affairs. Okay. I want to leave that out. Right. What would you do about Iran right now? I think we need to remember that the Iranian people are not our enemy. The Iranian leadership is not at all indicative of the uh, total attitude. Let me remind everyone of something. You may have forgotten this. On the night of September 11, 2001, when there was dancing in the street in Arab capitals around the country, in Tehran, they lit candles. We forget that. The Iranian people do not inherently hate Americans. In fact, there, there's a, a deep sense of angst within many Iranians because they had a long-time relationship with the American uh, people and even the American government. And with the, uh, the takeover of uh, radical Islamic factions, the leadership now being the sort of the visual and the vocal part makes a lot of Americans think that that is who they are. And I hope that uh, while I have nothing but contempt for Ahmadinejad and, and really he's the puppet, he's not the power, it's the Ayatollah behind him, but I'm not going to let it be lost on me that there is a, a vast number of Iranian people that would love to see. Um, something other than what they live under now. So uh, what does that translate into policy, or how does it translate? Well, we need it? to be tough with the leadership and make it clear that they are not going to have nuclear capacity. And they've made too many threats against Israel and the rest of the free world, that that's not an option. And that it's, it's not a matter of playing chicken with them. It's just a harsh sort of military reality. They're not going to have nuclear uh, so if you were president, I mean, would you do a strike against them? It would be a little presumptuous on my part to announce what I would do. I would look at all the options, but I would see to it they didn't have okay. nuclear capacity. Okay. Israel and the Palestinians, any, any hope there? I've been there? to Israel ten times. I've also been to virtually every one of the countries around it, Jordan, even Syria, Lebanon, Egypt. Um, my assessment is, and I'm, I'm proud, this, this may absolutely put me in such a small minority, I, I think this two-state solution is nonsense. Uh, it's absurd. I've always believed that. I think the American policy, if we're going to try to get these two warring factions to occupy the same piece of real estate and have two political entities, uh, in essence, layering over each other, is on its face absurd. We wouldn't tolerate it, and they're not going to tolerate it. And so. The longer we try to prolong this sense in which that's going to happen, I think it's uh, not going to happen. At best, it would be pieces of Jerusalem that could be an international city. But the Israelis have a right to security. They not only have a right to existence, which is a fundamental agreement dating back to the early, uh, early 1900s. It's not just 1948. It goes all the way back in the Balfour, uh, Balfour Resolution. And that was an agreed upon idea. Uh, they have that right to the homeland, but they also have a right for a secure homeland. And as one who's been there 10 times, many of you have as well, you know that the tiny sliver of real estate they occupy, occupy surrounded by people who are hostile to them, is really a very vulnerable uh, place for them. And I think we've got to come to grips with the fact that uh, trying to uh, hope for this two-state solution is simply not practical. Any thoughts on the country that's been a little bit in the background but might actually become the biggest threat uh, if taken over by terrorists, Pakistan? Interesting because I got pilloried by some of the secular press and, and particularly the, I call them the harumph crowd of D.C. because 
in uh, the fall of 2007, uh, I did an article for uh, Foreign Policy and gave a speech in Washington and specifically talked uh, at length about Pakistan, saying that the real threat that we need to look at was not Iraq, it was Pakistan, and that the next terrorist attack would be launched and conceived there, and that if we didn't put our focus there, we were making a huge mistake. And I was you know, considered an idiot and lacking in any understanding of foreign affairs, and now everyone talks about it with a sense of, well, of course we all knew this, and it's really frustrating to me at times to, to go back, and I would challenge you, you can find that article on the internet, read the article, and uh, a lot of the things that, that I said then I believe now, and that is that um, if we were to get a message today from Osama bin Laden, it would be postmarked Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Let me get back to politics for just one moment. Uh, how do Christian conservatives get out of this media stereotype of of self-righteousness and so forth? Is it a stereotype? Is there some truth to it? Do, do, what needs to change? Some truth. Uh, I think part of it is it's not what we communicate, it's the spirit in which we communicate that is equally important. It's very important that when we engage in issues, whether it's the issue of the sanctity of life or traditional marriage, that we don't do it with a combative spirit, that we don't do it with a, a sword in our hand, but we do it with, with a sense of civility I've always believed that if, if I really truly believe something and I know not what I believe but why I believe it, I'm not threatened because somebody has a polar opposite view. In fact, I welcome that view. That will sharpen me. It will be iron sharpening iron as one man sharpens another, says the Proverbs. Uh, there's a sense in which, and it's not just in the Christian world but in the conservative world, it's become that we hope that we can outshout the other side. And you see it on cable television. True. One of the things you'll notice about my show, if you don't watch it, what's wrong with you? Um, <laughs> if you do, you'll note that I'll have people on there as polar opposite of me as I can imagine. Bill Maher, Oliver Stone, Richard Dreyfuss. Uh, I've had people on that won't do any other show on Fox. But my philosophy is that the word host means something. And so does the word guest. It implies a certain level of civility, hospitality, and decorum that one would expect if you invited a guest to your home. As a host, you would treat that person with a certain level of respect, and you would expect that person would also respect your circumstances. We need that kind of, of rapport. I also believe that the biggest mistake we often make in engaging people on the left is that we interrupt them. I'm convinced that many of the leftist arguments will deconstruct as they're stated to their logical conclusion, and that's one of our failures. We interrupt them, let them talk, let them say what they believe, and then simply ask them, now, if that's your premise, doesn't it not lead to X? And if you do that, you'll find that most of the time they deconstruct before your very eyes. You don't have to argue with them. Turn them loose. And I think that most people will listen to that and say, my God. That's what they believe, yeah. and I think that's true on social as well as economic issues. Good. We're halfway through. Let's go to questions uh, from you all. You can line up at the mics, and, and while people are lining up, uh, what's, what's your favorite joke about a politician? <laughs> Probably uh, you know what the five most feared words of an Arkansas politician are? Nope. Will the defendant please rise? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it's really too true to be funny. But. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Do we have questioners or have you just marked them? Wow. Got one over here. going to control our future social security. So mm -hmm. um, what, what would you recommend in terms of direction or focus or how can these kids that are uniquely entering their world in a generation that's different than ours, what can you say to them from your experience about what they should best do? And thanks. 
what they should do in terms of how to sort of see the world and well, how they, how they can best impact their world because if they come to Kings or wherever they're going to go, um, it's, it's a generation First of all, dream big. Look at your role uh, for going to college, not as I want to get an education so I can get a job. I, I would make some assumptions that if you're coming to King's College, you probably are a person of faith. You have a commitment, not just to your intellectual potential, but your spiritual potential. I would hope that's true. may not be. Uh, but given the history of the school and, and even its sort of core values, I would make that assumption and hope that that would be a part of a person's decision. I don't want simply to uh, make a lot of money. I want to make waves. I want to make a huge difference in the world, not just a tiny one. Shoot for the goal of making a big one. And then if it's smaller than that, that's okay. But if you shoot for the goal of making a little one, you may undershoot. Secondly, prepare intellectually. One of the things that frustrates me most is when I hear people who speak and they obviously haven't done their homework. And they're, they're using heat instead of light. And it's very frustrating when I hear that. And I, if, you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, listen to a, uh, callers on talk radio. And they will just go on and on about things about which they know precious little. And they read it on the internet, so it's true. <laughs> That's all it has to be. Read it on the internet. And we've got to learn, to, to, and, and I would say this to every student here, uh, in the new media, there's something missing that was part of the old media. In the old media, the newspaper came to you, but before it was put on your doorstep, there was a reporter who went out and gathered it, but there was an editor who, when that reporter brought the story in, asked a hundred questions and said, how do you know? Where did you get this? Who was your source? Today, there is no editor. In fact, a lot of the newspapers don't have much of an editor either. So they're as bad as internet. But the, the new media, blogs, and sort of a direct-to-consumer model that we're living in, where information comes instantly, even cable news, uh, there's not time because everybody's trying to get it first, not right. And so it's about speed and timing more than it is about accuracy. As a result, I would say that more than ever, future generations are going to have to be incredibly discerning and very discriminating about what you allow, allow in. Create filters. Ask those very tough questions. How do I know this is true? What's the sources? Do, can I verify? The word veracity ought to become a part of every young person's vocabulary, and there ought to be this absolute obsession with the veracity of material, not simply the, uh, the volume of it. John. Uh, my name is Jonathan Schein. I'm a sophomore. And my question has to do with the future of the Republican Party. Um, in 2004, when I was 15, I campaigned for Bobby Jindal down in Louisiana. Uh, I also campaigned for David Vitter. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting experience that's kind of shaped the way I view the Republican Party. Um, what do you think the, the conservative movement and the Republican Party, are, are they the same thing? Or does the conservative, department, conservative movement need to take a step back from the Republican Party? And who are the leaders, um, the young leaders that you see being the bright spots of the Republican Party and the conservative movements? And what issues can conservatives take up that aren't, that, that, we, that they're not talking about right now? You know, what's, what's the way forward out of the stereotype? It's a whole battery of questions. <laughs> <laughs> all right, John, let me, let me do my best to, uh, you know, at my age, I don't know if I can remember all of them, but I'm going to try. Here, first of all, uh, there's a difference between conservatives and Republicans. Um, not all conservatives are Republicans. Some may be uh, in the Constitution Party or even Libertarians. Uh, and not all Republicans are conservatives. I would like to believe that all conservatives would be Republican and all Republicans would be conservative. That would be my goal. And frankly, when that happens, we will have a winning majority again. If you look back to the elections all the way back, let's say, to 1976, every time Republicans ran as solid principled conservatives they won. Every time they went to the mushy middle, they lost. Every time, without exception. And when I hear people say, well, the Republicans need to have this bigger tent. You know, we need to not be so 
adamant about uh, the sanctity of life and these divisive issues. Well, that's a sheer way to, I mean, history tells us if you want to lose, just keep doing that because that will sure put us in the losing streak. The second thing, though, the Republicans have to do when they get elected, they have to actually govern competently. And one of the problems that we've had, Republicans, by the way, let me just say, in the last two election cycles, Republicans did not get in trouble because they were conservative. They got in trouble because they didn't act like it when they got there. When, when their spending habits weren't any significantly different than the Democrats, and their approach to corruption wasn't anything to brag about, and uh, when their goals seemed to be to stay in power more than to empower people, and they totally violated the Tenth Amendment. One of the things for which I'm very unhappy, and I saw this as a governor so very firsthand, Republicans were worse than Democrats when it came to utterly trashing the uh, Jeffersonian principle of limited and local government. And they were very responsible for centralizing increased powers at the federal level. And that is appalling to me because it violates the, the fundamental idea of the strength of America, which was that you don't centralize power in any one place because whoever has it has too much of it. You disperse it, and it's in the states. And if it's not expressly in the Constitution, it's none of the federal government's business. It's left to the states, and we, we just violated that. The one the final thing that I remember you saying, who are the leaders? I think the mistake we're going to make right now is try to pick out who. We need to deal with what. It's not who's going to lead us. It's what we're going to agree to are our principles. And I think once we've determined that we still are going to be for lower taxes, rather than higher taxes, for limited government rather than unlimited, for more local rather than more federal, for strong national defense, for the principles of the sanctity of human life from the point of conception until its natural conclusion, uh, for traditional marriage. Uh, those, to me, core issues. Uh, we need to say, this is what we're going to believe. You want to be a who, line up with the what. If you don't line up with the what, you ain't going to be a who. That's what I'd rather see happen than to try to have people who uh, don't necessarily believe anything, except getting elected. Yes, uh, thank you for coming and conversing with us today, Governor Huckabee. I'm Jeremy Saron. I'm planning on being an incoming freshman in the fall this year. Great. And I'd like to know what your opinion is of the new Republican National Chairman, Michael Steele. I like Michael. I've known him a long time. Uh, I consider him a friend. And uh, I know that you know he's made a few statements here of late that were troubling, some to me, and I've, you know, I've made even some comments about him. I called Michael, we had a personal conversation specifically about the issue of abortion being an individual right. I think he, he, he made a very unfortunate choice of phrasing, because as he described to me, his mother was a uh, unmarried college student, became pregnant with him, and his point was, my mother made an individual choice and she was pro-choice. She chose me, and it was an individual choice. I think what he was attempting to do, given the nature of the publication, was to say something conservative in a way that was sort of um, appropriate to that venue. It didn't come out quite, I think, like he intended it. So I'm going to cut him some slack. And for people who say, well, should he be ousted? No, absolutely not. My gosh, if we ousted everybody who made a mistake, I wouldn't be sitting here today, I'll tell you that. And I sure made my share of them. Probably have today. I'll, I'll read something on a blog. Did you hear what Mike Huckabee said? <laughs> this week I've been beat up because I, I talked about the uh, issue, and, and it's a little deeper than what the blogs are saying, uh, abortion and slavery and the linkage. And, you know, so I had the NAACP in Missouri going nuts because I made this, and, and I, I want, I'd love to have him face me in public. Let's talk about it, because my point was, and just, and I'll get back to this, but my point was that one person cannot own another person. That's something we fundamentally have decided is a moral issue. The issue of terminating an unborn, innocent human life is really, do you give one person, in this case a biological mother, the level of domination to the degree that she can solely determine the life and death of another individual human being. Even if it's residing in her, it's still a different, it's a human being. And liberals love to talk science. They love to talk about how they're more scientific than we are. Well, let me give them some science. At the moment of conception, there are 23 chromosomes from a male and 23 from a female that become an individual that is unique. And its DNA schedule is not the father's or the mother's. It's a different one from either. It may not even share the blood type of the mother. It is life at that point, distinct, separate life. 
And scientifically, irrefutably, from a biological standpoint, it's human life. It can't be broccoli, a puppy, a dolphin, it is human life. My point was that the reason that we reject slavery is because it's not about race. Slavery was about ownership of people. It could have been that you could have had white slaves, or uh, we obviously didn't have, we had African Americans. But the, it wasn't about their race, it was about the cheap labor and the exploitation of a fellow human being who had as much right to be treated with respect and dignity of intrinsic value and worth as did a white person. And, and my point was that when you ever believe that it's okay to own another person, be it own them in the womb or own them on the plantation, you have violated their human spirit, you have violated their human dignity, you have exploited them and you have de demeaned their existence and God has made them, and if God had made them with equal worth and value that he made everyone else, and that worth and value is not to be cheapened because somebody said, well, he's not as smart, or he's not as white, or he's not as male, then, then that point is um, what's at stake. So that's, that was my point. Governor Huckabee, is there any going back um, to the roots of America, small government. You just mentioned giving states more power, and I think we'd be one of the few countries ever to actually reverse government getting bigger. So do you have any steps um, that you would have taken or you'd like to see taken to get America back to its roots of um, a small federal government? Uh, I'm not one who's giving up the hope that America can sort of find itself again. And I, I've, uh, America is a resilient country. I, I look at what we've been through. You know, if you looked at the Revolution or the Civil War or two world wars or the Depression with a very objective eye, you would not have believed that America would have come out of those at all, certainly not better and stronger after a certain period of time. So, I, you know, I'm not one that's going to be pessimistic. I do believe that if there are certain utter abandonment, uh, if there's a certain level of utter abandonment of core principles, and that includes the specialness of our nation, uh, that in fact we are here uh, as a part of the, uh, providence. I think if we utterly reject that, then we may not return. That's why I think it's so very important that we recognize the uh, unique role that this country has played because of the unique empowerment that he gave to the individual. That's what's really unprecedented. And we need to remember, it's not that so much our government, it's what our government sought to do our government sought to empower individuals, not groups, not races, not genders, not organizations, individuals, to lift up every individual as a single individual soul, competent, capable, and accountable. That's amazing. That's incredible. If we lose that, we're done. What I fear most is that we will become so uh, part of the group think. And if we do that and abandon ourselves to that, we may not be able to return. Thought on that, though, is remember that we, we don't get in these moments all of a sudden. We get there incrementally, and we get out of them incrementally. The challenge I would want to make to every conservative student is this. One reason conservatives sometimes have a problem is conservatives essentially don't like government. We don't think that's the answer. So conservatives often don't want to get into government because you don't have this fundamental attachment to, I think, government's it. You have an aversion to it. So you have to get over that. And you've got to be a part of the, the process. And secondly, don't look at politics as an event. See it as a process. When, when I talk, people ask me sometimes about running for office, and they know I've run a bunch, and so they ask me, what do you think? I'm thinking about running for Congress, or whatever. And here's the question that I'll ask them. I'll say, are you, how many times are you willing to lose before you get elected? And they say, well, I don't plan to lose. I said, that isn't my question. I asked you, how many times are you willing to lose before you get elected? And they, they act like, well, I guess if I lose, I'm not supposed to do this. I said, no, you're missing the point. This is a process. And if you're going to go out there in the, in the ring, get on the canvas, get hit, knocked down one round, and you're through, don't bother. We don't need you. You, you, you really do more damage than good. If you don't see this as something that you're willing to commit to long term, then you, you just need to help somebody else get elected. But if you're not willing to lose, you're not you're not worthy of winning. So 
Thank you again for coming. Um, I was wondering, how much of an impact do you think the, the evolution of language um, has affected, especially debates on, on moral issues? You said there's a switch from scientific, or a, a switch from moral to more scientific debate on things like um, abortion. Um, has it really affected your ability to, to not to debate well, but um, I appreciate people who are, are able to go up in front of um, millions of people and say exactly what they mean instead of, you know, glossing it over with fancy rhetoric. And so, um, so with political correctness and with, with the evolution of language, how do you think that has affected? Let, let me commend you. That's a brilliant question. And it's one of the most insightful ones I've heard in many, many months. And here's why. Because it is exactly what you just said that is one of our biggest uh, obstacles. We have allowed the left to capture the language. We have not challenged them. We've not held them accountable. This week alone, the administration is now saying we don't have a war on terror. We have overseas contingency operations. We don't have toxic assets anymore. We have legacy assets. Doesn't that sound different? I mean, I would never take my wife to the toxic spa, but to the legacy spa, she would enjoy an afternoon there. I mean, what a, what a difference. And, and you know, we, uh, we don't have acts of terrorism. We have man-made disasters. That's this week, just this week. Um, it, it's pretty, pretty amazing that language is as powerful as it is, but it is. And we need to be mindful and be, uh, I think, sharp and quick to call attention. For example, I never allow myself to be called anti-abortion. And, and when someone says, you're an anti I said, no, 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 you, I'm sorry, I'm not anti-abortion. I'm pro-life, and, and would you like for me to explain the difference? And of course they don't, but I'm going to anyway. So <laughs> I, I help them to understand that this is not about abortion, this is about life, and life doesn't end at the birth canal. And so I'm pro-life, which extends all the way to the extent of that person's natural existence. And, so that doesn't make me any abortion. I challenge people. I don't allow them to be pro-choice. I say, what choice? If a person chooses to keep the baby, you don't seem to be as happy about that choice. So why don't we call you what you are? You're, you know, pro-individual right to terminate a life position. Anyway, I, language is important, and you have really captured that very well. And I hope that um, you'll not give up on that thought. And one of our greatest enemies is political correctness. We're so afraid we're going to offend somebody. I've come to the conclusion I'm going to offend some people. And, you know, if I really goof it up, I'll apologize. But for the most part, they're going to have to get over it. Returning to your question about, um, you made a comment, uh, rather, saying no company is too big to fail. What do you do about a company such as Citigroup without causing a panic on the streets because a bank is failing? Um, Citigroup is a lot larger than Walmu. And I'm not sure if there's a company that would be able to purchase out uh, Citigroup without some kind of government help. Um, what, what would be your solution for this problem? Well, first of all, I would have changed uh, mark-to-market rules that would have created a different financial environment for a lot of these big companies. Many of uh, those companies, their assets were artificially devalued, not because they actually had lost that much value, but because on paper, under the mark-to-market -market rules, uh, that they were devalued. And so it's a matter of, for example, this chair. I may say that chair cost $100 when we bought it. But now nobody's buying chairs. So, gosh, chairs are going for 20 That chair's only worth $20. No, actually, that chair's worth uh, whatever it sits there being. If it's still a chair, it's worth a chair. And it didn't devalue just because another chair somewhere else lost value. But if we, if we value this chair for the value of all the chairs that are now sitting on the showroom floor, yeah, this chair's lost value. That's an oversimplification of it. But that's part of what has created a lot of the, the anxiety and even the, uh, uh, the breakdown in the economy, is that we have devalued things that had value because of the value of things that were similar to it. And that's unfortunate. We should have changed that law. We should have suspended it to see if that would have shorted, uh, shorted up. But you know, here's the other thing that I would come to. People talk about the worst case scenario. What if? What if? We don't really know what if. But here's the what if I have. If we continue to prop up 
private companies with taxpayer money, and I don't like to use the word government money because I like to remind myself this is not the government's money. This is taxpayer money. It's people went out and worked really, really hard last week. They drove trucks and they pumped gas and they lifted heavy things on uh, stock room floors, and the government took money away from them, and now it's going to give it to the wealthiest, most mismanaged companies, some of which are going to turn around and give it in the form of big bonuses to people who live better than these people will ever dream. They won't even be able to, you know, wipe their feet on the doormat, which I'm not, it's, that's not class warfare. I'm just saying that these are the people paying for it. If that company fails, they shouldn't have managed themselves like that. Is there a pain? Yep, probably. And there may be a residual effect that will hurt the guy down there. But you know what's going to hurt him more? Is if in the future he continues to work harder and harder and harder and he never gets to keep anything because it's paying off the increased obligations that have been incurred to bail this guy out up here. What I worry about more is not people my age. I worry a whole lot about guys your age. I worry about the people who are, I have children who are 26, 28, and 32. I worry a lot about them. And when I hear people say, oh, gosh, what might happen to the markets today? I'm more worried about what's going to happen to my children's future in 20, 30 years. And, and here's one thing I would want to ask you to, to take a little historical perspective. My parents' generation were called the greatest generation. And the reason is, is they lived through the Depression and the World War, World War II, and their basic philosophy of life was, we will make whatever sacrifices that we must in order that our children will have a better life. They never wanted us to go through what they went through. And they said, whatever it takes. And I saw my parents make sacrifices, some of which I didn't fully understand until I was an adult. But they knew they wanted for me to have a better education, a better life. They wanted more for me than they had for themselves. And they sacrificed that I could live better. What I see happening now is that the current generation, mine, I'm ashamed to say this, we're saying, we don't want to have, a, we don't want to have any problems. So... <laughs> We're going to sacrifice our children and grandchildren so we don't have to suffer. And yet, it's our own greed that's really behind this. And I would say that not many blocks from here on Wall Street, where the meltdown really sort of was centered, it was not so much a money problem, it was a moral problem that brought it down. It was people who thought they could somehow make a quick buck uh, and pass on the burden and responsibility of how they made it to somebody else before it caught up with them. It was a house of cards destined to come down. And when the uh, marketplace became less about investing in actual products and services and started becoming increasingly about betting on what a product or service would be worth in the future, and money was not being made by saying, I'm buying chairs, but I'm buying what a chair will cost in the future, hoping that I can trade that off. Folks, we were gambling. We weren't investing, and that's what we did. We turned Wall Street into Las Vegas East, and it became just another casino. See, we have about eight minutes left and seven people lined up, so let's try, you know, short oh, questions, yeah. short answers. Exactly, yes. yes. I'm Heather Bordasco. I'm the uh, mother of an incoming freshman to the King's College uh, next year. A couple things. First of all, I loved your book. Read it on a plane, which was dangerous Thank because you. it was all I could do not to stand up and scream, finally, somebody, <laughs> somebody is saying something that I can really Heather, believe Heather, that would have been fine. You should do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, my husband already says that I'm never going to die of a heart attack because I tell everybody what I think all the time. But secondly, I want to thank you so much for one of the things you said is that you have three great children and that they love God. And I've told my kids constantly, whatever you do in life, it doesn't matter if you don't have a relationship with God. So I thank you for that. And my, my question is, um, it seems to me that one of the big problems in the country, um, both in business, that uh, we have so much begun to distrust and hate authority that we're unwilling to have sources of accountability in our lives. So my question to you would be, how do you personally keep yourself accountable? And what would your recommendation be for these students so that they can have some areas of accountability in their lives? That's a great question. Um, the primary way I can keep both feet on the ground is being married to Janet for 35 years. And, you know, all the people come up to me and tell me, I just love you. I love your show. I, believe me, she hears all that. And, takes me aside and tells me how it really is. So I, mean, I think God gives us wives so that we, uh, you know, stay, stay grounded. Amen. Uh, I also have a very close relationship with my with my pastor, and uh, I I need accountability in my spiritual life, and you know we communicate regularly, and 
I've asked him to make sure that I'm accountable to him on a spiritual level because I, I need that. And so he checks on me every week, and that's important to me. And I've got a few close friends, and when I say a few close friends, these are friends before politics. And the reason that's important is because they loved me when I was in the third grade, and I didn't have a pair of shoes that didn't have holes on. So, you know, I, I know that their devotion and loyalty to me has nothing to do with some position I have uh, held or some job I currently have, and, and uh, everyone needs that. Hi, um, I'm from California, and my state's 